You know, growing up at Christmas time, uh, there's only one thing you ever wanted when you were younger snow. Snowball fights, uh, forts. How many of you remember snow being so deep that you could actually build forts? Think about uh, growing up making money, shoveling snow, building snowmen, uh, sledding, skiing. You'd look out the window at bedtime and um, there would not be very much and you'd wake up in the morning and there'd be this, there'd be blankets of snow. Purity, beauty. Snow has been the, the symbol of, of, uh, of unity for, in, in purity for as long as anybody can remember. Shakespeare is credited with the phrase, pure as the driven snow. But really the idea of snow and, and, and cleanliness was used in the Bible. Uh, so, what I wanted to do this morning, I wanted to look at the Bible. We're going to close out our series on the colors of Christmas. And I wanted to, I wanted to look at and see about purity, about, uh, about love. And, and hopefully, uh, everybody here can have a white Christmas because of that. Isaiah was a prophet who uh, lived about 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And his job was to speak on behalf, speak to the people on behalf of God. So when Isaiah spoke, there, there was no completed word, no completed Bible like we have today. So God used people to speak his word prophetically to his people. And so he writes pretty much out of a vision that he has and, and it has been given to him by God. Now when he had this vision, it was a tough time in the history of God's people. Uh, Israel had been divided into uh, north and south regions and, and they're being attacked by other nations. Let me read you a couple passages. This is in the first chapter. Hear me, you heavens. Listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master. The donkey its owner's manger. manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. And then he said this a verse later. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord, and they've spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. They're, they're turning away from God, and that's why they're suffering. And then further on, God says, I'm tired of your, so your offerings, I'm tired of your sacrifices. They don't mean anything to me at all. You're just going through the motions. And eventually God will say, I'm going to close my eyes and ears from you when you pray. And then God tells them to do something very, very specific. He says this, wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. In other words, stop being bad. It's like God saying, I'm going to put you on my naughty list. Do you ever feel like this kid? That's why you're on the naughty list. I swear, trust me. Well, that's why you're on the naughty list. Because, because you're being naughty right now. So you've got to be on the naughty list if you keep talking like that. No, no, no. It was fun for Christmas. Not being very nice to me. Because you're being naughty. So you're on the naughty list. No, I'm not. I'm on the good list, actually. 
You're not, because you, you're not, because you ain't any good. Father Christmas was rung, rung me last night when I was at work and said, you better tell Jackson to start being a good boy or he's going to stay on the naughty list and he won't get no presents for Christmas. That's what he said to me. So you've got to start being a good boy. You know, I'm going to do what I forgot to him. Well, you know, I'm going to do what I forgot to him. You're just silly, man. Hey, trust me, I'm not on the bad list. You're on the naughty list, mate. <laughs> I'm going to uppercut his beard. I'm going to uppercut his beard. One thing. Don't be British. You ever feel like that, kid? Uh, I know we laugh at that. But uh, in the Old Testament, it kind of worked that way. Um, if God's people sinned, they needed an annual sacrifice to remove their sin. And lots of people look at God as if he keeps a naughty list. You stop going to church, you're on the naughty list. You weren't singing during that song, you're on the naughty list. You were just moving your lips, you're on the naughty list. You haven't been giving to the church like you should, you're on the naughty list. You are off the nice list. So many people think this place is, is governed by rules that we have to follow. You need to wear certain clothes. You need to listen to certain music. You do them wrong and God is disappointed with you and you go on the naughty list. And for so many people it is hard to let go of that way of thinking. You, you lose a job, you, you get injured, you have relationship problems. What did I do to make God mad at me? He must be punishing me. If you think like that, here's some good news. Christmas is the reason why we don't have to feel or think or live that way. Let me explain. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, he says this. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your, skin, your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. That's a prophetic reference to the coming of Jesus Christ. Now there's others. I, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. We've read this before but it says, Therefore the Lord will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That was written 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And at the time it was written, it was written about what was happening, like I said, in Jewish history. To talk to a Jew, they would say, no, this is not about the Messiah. It's about a sign of King Ahaz. Well, at that time, Ahaz was, was worried about the Assyrians coming to conquer him. So God gave this to Ahaz as a sign. The idea is that you would see this woman bear a child called Emmanuel before he, and before he's old enough to, to know right from wrong, the Assyrians would be gone. The thing is that this prophecy did come true for Ahaz. But it's also a prophecy for us. It happened both future soon and future later. It wasn't until Matthew writes in his gospel and saw this as an upper, another prophecy that pertained to this man, Jesus, that, that we follow. So when Isaiah says that your, your sins are be white as snow and washed white as snow, that's a prophecy for the future. That's saying that you're going to be free from your sins 
once and for all. Not, not marked by sin, but pure as the driven snow. However, in today's society, it's not popular <coughs> to tell people that they are sinners. There are some churches that have, that have gotten away from that because they don't want people to leave. You know, it's more important that when you come here to some folks that you leave feeling really good instead of being told the truth. But the truth is that you have to come to Jesus to get rid of your sin. It's a reality. Sin is a, is a, is a part of our nature. You spend a few moments watching the news or surfing the web, and it will prove it to you. Terrorist attacks, government leaders fighting and lying, students shooting each other, ball players fighting, people screaming at each other, stay on the road for five minutes. And I proved my point. We need a savior. We look at other people and, and we compare ourselves. They're terrible. But we also need to look at ourselves, our thoughts, our desires, and our actions. We have all sinned and fallen short of God's standard. That's in the book of Romans. It says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That was written after Jesus was born, <coughs> lived, and died, and was resurrected. It was written by the Apostle Paul. He's writing about this sin nature that is in all of us that needs to be cleansed. <coughs> Basically, it means that, that, that God bought this forgiveness with the blood of Jesus. God made a, a clear way for you and me to eliminate sin from our lives so that we can be forgiven and draw close to him. You go to Romans chapter 10. I'm not sure exactly where I am on all these here. Um, I, all right. I'm, give me a moment here. Go to Romans 10. And Paul said, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let me read it again. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord... And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Accepting Jesus is the only way to have a truly white Christmas. Because it is the blood of Jesus that cleanses you. It's the only thing that can take away your sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 is a really, really great verse to memorize. John said, if you confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse us, just like Isaiah said, to wash us so that we will be white as snow. If you've never done that, you can do that. There's nothing stopping you. It's a, it's a free gift that God willingly gives to you. Don't leave here without understanding that you have access to that gift. God is willing to clean your slate, to take away your sin, to make you white as snow. That's the whole reason for Christmas. Now, if you're already a believer, your sins are forgiven. The Bible says he takes our sins and moves them as far away as the east is from the west. God remembers your sin no more. You are white as snow. Yeah, but I don't feel that way. Maybe because of family drama. Or maybe things that you said or things that you did. If you feel like that, it's probably because of one or two reasons. First, you could be stuck in a in a pattern of sin 
your anger, your bitterness, uh, your thought life, maybe the way you treat people. And you need to claim the promises that Jesus made, that you are forgiven. And sometimes you simply need to ask for help. That is, if you're stuck in a pattern of sin. But secondly, sometimes you simply can't forgive yourself. Another way of saying that is that you keep yourself on the naughty list. And you know in your heart you're forgiven. You know in your head you're forgiven, but in your heart, you don't know how that's possible. Let me say it like this. God sees you differently than you see yourself. Learn to see yourself the way that God sees you. You are precious in his sight. When God sees you, he sees the image of his son, pure and clean. Does that mean I'll never sin again? Nope. We are still being perfected. But the point is that God loves you. So, are you dreaming of a white Christmas? Yes. Maybe it can be the kind where the weight and the shame of sin are thrown off for good. You know, the true reason for Christmas has always been about salvation. Let's pray. Father, Christmas is so much more than unwrapping a gift that we asked our parents for or Santa for. Christmas is so much more than getting together with those that we love. Christmas is so much more than looking at lights or buying things or paying off credit cards. Christmas, pure and simple, is Jesus. This Christmas, may we call upon you to forgive us, perhaps for the very first time, that we might be white as snow, that we would be off the naughty list, that you desire to see us as you see your son, precious. We pray that that would be so. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now, there's a reason why you're out of here a little early today, and that is the hope that you will go downstairs to eat the cake that I fixed. <laughs> Just kidding, I didn't make the cake. But there is a cake down there. And would love to have you go down and be a part of this. Um, the kids will be there. If you want to be able to express your uh, appreciation, there's, there is nothing, you know, there's some churches that say, if the children make noise in the church, we don't want them here. That's not here. Now, we don't want them to stand up and go, you know, make a lot of noise if they don't have to, but we're so glad we have kids. There's so many churches that don't have kids. But if you want to show your appreciation to them, let me encourage you to get downstairs and, uh, and mingle a little bit. Okay? Let's stand for a benediction. Like I was said, we do have a Christmas Eve candlelight service tonight. It's exactly the same service, except tonight, Sharon gets to play. So everything else is exactly the same. So if you want an encore, you can come again. But uh, be here at 7 o'clock, and we'll start. Let's pray together. May you go in the grace and peace of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And may, may you remember that the one who came, he still comes. And the one who spoke, he still speaks and wants us 
desperately wants us to be calling him Lord and Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen.